Welcome to the First Mining Gold webinar. First Mining is a Canadian gold development company. They have two multi-million ounce projects in Canada. Today, we're going to focus in on one of those projects, their Du Parquet project in Quebec. There's a lot of activity going on in the gold mining sector in Quebec right now, and First Mining is right in the thick of, thick of it. We're joined by Dan Wilton. He's the CEO of First Mining Gold. James Maxwell, he's the VP of Exploration, and Carolyn Pinar, the Manager of Ex Exploration. Everyone, welcome to the webinar. Thank you. Thanks for having us, Ron. Yeah, Thank Julie, you, Ron. You, yeah, there's a lot of exciting things to talk about at the company as a whole. Uh, again, we're going to focus in on Quebec and Du Parquet today, but maybe it'd be helpful to our viewers if uh, James and Caroline just give us a little, tell us a little bit about their background and how that might apply to what's going on um, at Quebec and within the company right now. Caroline, would you like to go first? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm Caroline Pinar. I'm the exploration manager, as Ron said. I joined the company in 2021, um, soon after immigrating from South Africa. Um, and I've been here since, uh, happily to be part of the team. I'm a geologist by trade. I spent most of my career working in the gold sector, um, underground predominantly, and then moved over into, from South Africa into international operations over time. Um, most of my career is sort of building and trying to integrate myself into the full mining value chain. I've also pursued um, academic programs to give me that exposure and to help to fully immerse myself into um, mineral exploration and development opportunities. Thank you. James, could you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, so I'm a geologist as well and, you know, have a great deal of exploration history operating in what would be the northern components uh, of the continent here in North America. So that includes largely what we consider Archean uh, aged rocks. And certainly there are a series of rocks that are very, very uh, known for their, their gold endowment. So uh, I've spent about... Uh, over 20 years now working in Archean greenstone belts in Canada, um, in the jurisdictions of Ontario, Quebec, Manitoba, and Nunavut. Spent a lot of time looking at these deposits, uh, evaluating them, uh, as well as the opportunity to look at some of them around the world, including Australia, and certainly really appreciate my time and expertise in focusing on two great ones uh, that we have at First Mining in Springpool and Duparquet. Thank you, James. And uh, Dan Wilton, CEO of First Mining Gold, could you maybe give us a, a brief synopsis overall of the company, kind of where we are now and, and where, where you see it heading here in the in the future? Sure. So uh, an exciting time for First Mining. So, uh, you know, we have two of the 10 largest undeveloped gold projects in Canada and uh, advancing those projects uh, down uh, different paths right now with our Spring Pole project uh, targeting submitting our final environmental assessment on spring pool uh, at the end of this month, which has been a process we've been in for, you know, uh, six and a half going on seven years. So very exciting time to be moving forward there. And then uh, at Duparquet, this is a project that we consolidated our ownership uh, in uh, a couple of years ago. So we own it 100%. Uh, it's located in the middle of the Abitibi uh, Gold Belt, which stretches uh, really from, uh, call it Val d'Or, Quebec, to Timmins, Ontario, um, and a little bit further south to Kirkland Lake would be kind of the three main, call it main corners of the Abitibi. But this is one of the most prolific gold belts in the world. Uh, I heard a statistic today that something like 90% of the gold that's ever been produced in Canada has come out of the Abitibi. So remarkable mineral endowment and more discoveries happening all the time. So that's why it's really exciting that, you know, what we're starting to uncover there um, and really on the back of what has been very systematic, focused, uh, first principles geolo geology work that uh, James and Caroline and the team have done. Uh, to A, really understand what we have at Duparquet, which is one of the largest undeveloped gold projects in Quebec, and B, then from understanding it better, understand where we can see it continue to grow. And that's where it gets really exciting and I think what the team will talk about today. Sounds great. Sounds great. So so James and Caroline, as you, as you look at this project, uh, obviously there's already millions of ounces of gold that's been 
uh, defined in the ground. Is the push as we move forward to further define the existing deposit and or to, to do more exploration to find more gold? How would you describe the, I guess, the strategy to the uh, to, to the viewer? So it becomes a bit of both. I mean, obviously, we want to understand and extrapolate the full endowment uh, of our project and, and property uh, at Duparquet. And so with that, you know, we will continue to explore. We will continue to build out uh, our project to ensure that it has the best, you know, path forward for potential development. You know, and that's through a number of exploration avenues, not just including, um, you know, working around the foundational resource we have today, but new discovery. And I think that's probably one of the the more exciting attributes uh, that we have to offer is that you know we've got a, a large land position uh, of mineral tenure in uh, the Abitibi in Quebec, and we have the opportunity to unlock additional new discoveries. And that's that's really what's key to having some of these jurisdictions that Dan speaks to in the Abitibi is that, you know, that endowment history. I mean, it's a known quantity that there is a lot of gold there. And there's one thing that makes these jurisdictions great. It's, it's the fact that they do have new discoveries and ongoing, and it becomes a factor of inputs. The more you put in, um, you know, typically the more you get out. So um, from that aspect, I think the exploration is quite exciting. Exciting. However, I think, you know, Dan spoke to that sort of first principles piece, which is that buildup of the characterization. So, yes, we're doing a lot of work around the existing resource as well to ensure that we well understand it, to ensure that we know, um, you know, where the, the limits and boundaries of that are and bring them down as well. So it's it is both. We are doing a lot of work on advancing the resource as well as growing it through exploration. OK, OK, interesting. And, and as you look back on your career, James, uh, you've worked for some other big gold companies. You've worked for, you know, doing exploration work successfully in the past. Can you touch on that and in, in, in how you think that experience uh, applies to what you're seeing now at, at the Duparquet project in Quebec? Yeah, I think it really comes back to some of the characterization. And and for that reason, whether it's abroad on other projects or whether it's in-house at, at a different scale, um, I think the idea is once you understand what makes systems tick or what makes systems come together in gold endowment, it allows you to unlock them. And so, you know, it's a bit of a, a checkers game to understand all the components that are on the board and then make the best move. And that's what we're doing at Duparquet is we've really assessed what, what's on the board and what the geoscience is telling us through, call it historical work, call it analogous deposit settings around the world. Um, but ultimately what we know is that, you know, there is, you know, no finite limit to this currently. We know that it's open um, you know, in many directions, it's open for new discovery. And so from that factor, it's really about, you know, leveraging that forward. So once we understand the components um, of the geoscience that make the, the mineralization occur, we can then look for similar settings and, and similar details that allow us to unravel either new discoveries or extensions. And, and once you get onto that trail, it just becomes, you know, more momentous in the amount you unlock it. And so we've been working on this project through as an exploration group uh, for approximately 24 months. And that's about the time it takes to really get the geology team understanding the components, understanding um, the opportunities, and then really making business decisions that help us unlock additional, you know, value through exploration. Yeah. yeah. So you, you can work to, de to, to define the existing deposit, but also there's exciting opportunity uh, on the ex exploration front as well to find even more, more gold as we move forward. 100%. And, and I mean, yeah, that's yeah. really it. James, maybe just uh, spend a minute talking about about your experience at Back River, what the deposit looked like when you got there and then through your exploration efforts where that ended up. I mean, the Back River deposit, uh, which was Sabina uh, Gold and Silver, uh, got acquired by uh, B2 Gold a year and a bit ago for $1.1 billion. So I think it is, it's germane and relevant <laughs> I, to the topic I like, I, I, I like the sound of that $1.1 billion. Uh, go ahead, James. <laughs> yeah. And so realistically, you gotta, you gotta understand, you know, what the path is to, to being successful. And, and really it is that unlocking, right? I mean, you really want to make sure that you get full value for everything you have, and it doesn't matter, you know, what assets you own, you want to make sure you fully appreciate what's there. And so, 
you know, it, it comes through doing the the work needed to understand, I think, the endowment level to begin with. And, you know, we know from from the metrics of the current resource and, you know, we can talk about so many ounces that occur in a in a vertical meter, in a vertical foot, however you want to project that across the project. And, you know, it tells us that, you know, there's additional ounces to be found. And so we can look at the expiration history. And usually these things go in cycles, right? You know, the market cycles take on, um, you know, there's a bunch of work done. And realistically, you know, it's, it's whether you score a goal or not. And so for us, you know, we spend a lot of time, you know, setting up, you know, call it the playbook to make sure that we're going to have some success on the other end, you know, that has an outcome of favorability. And, and we know that these are there to evolve, but we have to use the resources at hand to be successful. So similar to Back River, there are certain thresholds that we needed to, to meet in order we felt to be successful. And, you know, having multi-million ounce uh, potential was part of that. But you have to be able to drive uh, the project to those milestones as well. You know, making people believers is part of it, but showing it and putting the resources on the books is a big part. So, you know, that's a that's one where we took, you know, substantial resources um, from, you know, single millions to, you know, multi-millions uh, upwards, I think, all told of, uh, you know, quite a significant amount, $1.1 billion in takeout. And I'll just be cautious around the, the resource terminology and classification. But, you know, we've got a three and a half million ounce base at Duparquet and measured and indicated. And we've got about a two and a half million ounce base uh, in inferred, inferred resources um, at Duparquet. So again, significant size and it, it offers significant optionality. But, you know, it also projects that, you know, with the level of work done historically, I mean, if we were to double that footprint, if we were to triple that footprint, um, you know, we believe that we could be successful in growing the resource, you know, in a similar uh, order of magnitude by doing such. And that's kind of what we've been doing. We've been putting the pieces together, the foundational work over about two years to really take this to the next level where we start increasing the inputs. We start turning the volume up, which is really the, the drill meters, which is really the geoscience work, uh, which is the characterization. And we should be able to start to see this return, you know, through a series of programs that are phased and include uh, a number of future resource updates. Okay. Thank you, James. Caroline, what, what about your background and your experiences? Uh, how, how are you applying them to what's happening now at Du Parquet? And I guess, what are you, what are you most excited about when you, when you look at that project? Well, so I spent most of my career working for a company that had multiple million ounce deposits and, you know, growing through that organization, getting gaining more exposure to each one of those projects um, in different jurisdictions and countries, um, I believe, you know, I had the opportunity to see a lot of, of that deposits. They were also in various stages from like full production or development or at the exploration phase. So again, just understanding what it takes to drive something along that path um, was, was quite important for me. Um, so coming from the other side of the value chain into the junior mining space, I think, you know, having that experience and exposure, knowing what to look for, knowing what makes the economics tick, um, you know, what are the drivers in terms of realizing this project potential and like what, when, when is something, you know, a push on and when is it like, okay, I need to take a step back, understand the data, do the gap analysis, get the data, um, and then using that to set up our programs. Um, we have a strong focus on the strategy, um, which is something I, I really enjoy. And I think having that strategic outlook um, with a longer term vision and then building up that foundation in support of that strategy is what is important. And yeah, what gets me excited for Dupar Gang. Thank you. Thank you. You know, back in June, uh, there was a press release, some drill results that came out, which um, which to me were uh, uh, in, 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 in indicated that uh, that there is more gold to be found uh, at this project. Dan, could you touch on or, or James or, or Caroline, whoever would like to kind of what uh, what what we saw in this press release and, and what it means for the growth of the project? Well, yeah. specifically, we're talking about the the release that had a whole Duparque twenty four twenty four in it. Yes. yes. Um, uh, I mean, I'll give you my take, and then I'll turn it over to the people who actually made it all happen. Um, uh, I think one of the really important things uh, from that hole was showing a couple of things. Number one, there are 
a number of mineralized zones. Like the, you ended up hitting, I think, seven different mineralized zones inside that one hole, which shows, I think, the, the kind of robustness of mineralization through that ore body. But the most important thing were some of the widths and elevated grades that we were seeing. And not just that we happened to hit them inside the same old mineralization. I think it was a really clear articulation of the fact that there is higher grade structurally controlled on the contact uh, of what is the style of mineralization in the in the cyanide intrusive, which is kind of the only thing that's ever been looked for at Duparquet. So James and Caroline can talk more about it, uh, but that to me was, you know, I think showing increasing grades of depth, showing really significant widths, those are the types of intercepts around which underground mines are made. Yeah, and maybe Carolyn, you want to talk a bit about the strategy behind, you know, how we evolve a system like that, and I can get maybe more into the geoscience specifics. Yeah, uh, again, a um, very exciting target for us, quite a bit of work spent by the team integrating a lot of the data and digging into that geosciences. Um, but the strategy there was to understand, you know, how we can learn a bit more about um, the higher grade control opportunities at Duparquet. We started picking up on the cyanide um, and the T2 structures coming across that contact and the change in lithology, what drives it. And as Dan said, you know, getting intercepts of almost six gram per ton over 33 meters is quite meaningful um, at those depths because it plays into that underground. But yeah, a lot of work went down understanding what the main control uh, the plunge of the mineralization is what we need to do to step that out um, and then through the work and integrating again all of this data sets we were able to delineate that there's a secondary control on the mineralization with even higher grade opportunities so the focus was on building that out testing that model and theory and and you know going out with the drill bit and then actually pursuing it. We had the opportunity with um, three to four holes, stepping that out, hole 18, um, 22, 24, 19 as well, um, just confirming that theory. And now we're doing the work um, further advancing and driving that opportunity down as it goes into depth where the mineralization is quite open. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Caroline. Uh, I, I really appreciate, you know, the description and it really, you know, discusses a bit of what we call vectoring. And it's really about the recipe of ingredients that come together to make this successful host setting. And, you know, one of the things that we want to do in our work is get to the best, you know, and grade and mineralization, we'll call it in terms of, you know, breadth and robustness, we want to get to that first. You don't want to get to it last. You want to be aiming for that stuff and guiding yourself along the way towards getting to the best stuff, especially when you've got a project that has significant, um, you know, resource foundation already. We've got a lot of ounces, you know, we've got a global resource grade um, that we really appreciate. But what we do know is that there's some better zones there and we want to find them and expand them um, first. And we want want to obviously get them to the front end of our potential for developing the project. So how to do that is, you know, we characterize where those grade settings occur. And between Caroline and Dan, they spoke a little bit towards the structural aspects. They spoke a little bit to the, the host rock affinity, which, you know, we can almost describe as the vehicle. It's the type of car. It's the type of vehicle that's really carrying the gold. And as you know, some vehicles can carry bigger loads. And that's kind of our grade threshold. And what we're focused on here is trying to find, you know, that right type of rock setting that attributes to better grades, to the right widths, and has, you know, ultimately what we would hope is the best value. So, you know, we've done a lot of work in setting that up. In this case, you know, these are rocks that haven't been as well characterized on the property. And because it's complex, it takes work. It's like anything else. Usually if there's some unlocking or some discovery, it's because somebody put some effort into it. And it's not that our predecessors hadn't done good work. They've done a lot of work. They did it on a bulk scale. Um, it's our ability though, as we go deeper, we need to really fine tune the resolution. We really need to have a clear picture as we expend additional resources and need to have a, a, a recurring or, or higher priced value value prize coming back, we really need to fine tune the input. So we've done a lot of work to understand, you know, what is it that makes the better grade systems tick? 
And what we're seeing is that it is in contact with a different vehicle. It is something that we would call a mafic volcanic sequence. Um, it has the ability to typically host higher grade mineralization. And that's one of the things about understanding these types of systems is understanding, you know, what the components you want to see on the highest level of favorability. And, you know, in the old days, we used to do charts on favorability of, of different elements or ingredients. You know, how much of this ingredient do you want? How much ingredient? you know, how much of this ingredient do you want? And so we've kind of tuned our scale to understand that, you know, we're looking for a specific vehicle type. We're looking for it to be in a certain structural regime. We're looking for it to be hosting, you know, certain other elements that come with that in terms of alteration. And then when we put that together, when we put all the different layers together, you know, we can start to target this. And that's kind of what you're seeing in those results from June is that, you know, we picked three to four areas that we thought you know, could have success in, in sort of the makeup of components that we're looking for. And then we've driven the drilling towards them. And definitely some of them are direct hit. You know, we are very happy with, you know, the, the ultimate uh, um, intercepts that we've put out in June, especially in hole 2424. I mean, they're absolutely uh, encouraging into the amount uh, of opportunity for not only just, you know, growth, um, but the, it, it also suggests that more of these settings are going to occur. And so in some of the other holes, that's what we're seeing. We're seeing that, you know, we're starting to get the favorability in those other ingredients that we're after and that's what's not only our our plan is not only unlock what we know today but then vector towards new areas that have that exact same recipe and we're just going to keep repeating it and that's kind of when we talked about previous successes and other projects for growth that's kind of the thing is once you understand the recipe and once you start really learning how to put these pieces together it just gets easier it's like yeah. anything else you work on or fixing something like once you've done it a few times it gets easier and i'm sure you know even with ron's basement every show yeah. it's it's almost <laughs> runs itself i bet today oh yeah yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah yeah as you can tell i'm just always so comfortable when i'm down here in the basement sure <laughs> but but what i'm thinking is i is i hear you saying that uh james is that you almost get a like a sixth a sixth sense or a feel after you spend the time, because there, there is a certain degree of art form, I would imagine, in, in, in doing exploration work, right? It's not all black and white, but the, is it, is it, is it an accurate statement to say that you develop kind of a feel for the land, a feel for the geology, and then over yeah, years? It, it's data driven, Ron, like it, it's right. data driven. So, it, you know, it, it does seem black box, but at the end of the day, it's data driven. And today, yeah. you know, obviously the computing power, the leverageability of data is, is higher than it's ever been. So mm -hmm. with, with that, I think, you know, there is a time where, yes, there's a geologic experience and education that needs to be with that. You know, obviously it takes a, a little bit of gut feel and interpretation, yeah. but I think you combine that with, you know, a real strong balance of data, um, you know, and then also in a team setting. We're very fortunate to have an internal team. And again, that's been working on this for 24 months, seeing things together, talking through things together. It's it, it really is that team aspect that's going to drive you, you know, to the finish line with success. So it, it, it is a bit of gut, but it's very data driven. Data driven, right. Is uh, mm -hmm. investors and the market always love to hear about drill results. What's the current status right now? You've talked about kind of your strategy behind how you determine, are there drills turning? Are there, are, are we going to see some drill results uh, in the near future? Yeah, Carolyn, why don't you explain a little bit about what we've done, you know, over the last two years and this year and just, you know, where we are in the program. And yes, we are active today, Ron. We're quite okay. active and coming through the end of year, but Caroline, I'll give you an update. <laughs> So first mining started drilling on the project May of last year. Um, we had quite a big program, um, roughly 7,000 meters that we drilled in 2023. Yeah, just need to check the year again. Um, <laughs> time's flying. And then this year, um, we started the program again, um, drilling, continuously advancing on those successes and then coming across the property, you know, focusing on resource expansion and growth opportunities, extensional opportunities, um, driving the, the discovery sort of level down, and then also focusing on regional target development. This year, um, we are coming up to a 12,000 meter program. That's more or less where we are about now. We have two drills turning on the project and we, we're doing quite a bit of work and we're having good successes. So we had 
follow up news results. Um, when was that? In August, I believe, on yes. one of our targets, the Valentia one as well. Um, and definitely more to come on some of the other successes that we are seeing and learning on this project. Um, with that, we've also spent quite a bit of time um, working on you know airborne geophysical survey across the full property. We did a LIDAR survey. Um, which also helps the exploration and the vectoring. We integrated that and all of this data that we've inherited built on into what you would call the expanded 3D model that now covers the full property from Duparquet to Pitt and Duquesne, where we have these resource centers. Um, and that gives us the opportunity, uh, as we've said a couple of times, to, to like look at this holistically um, and driving those opportunities. So this builds up our target pipeline. It drives up you know, our opportunities to continue drilling. And, and we've identified quite a significant um, you know, I would say project pipeline, target pipeline for development and further advancement. Yeah. So the news side is going to continue to flow, Ron, just to get right to sort of the update piece. I mean, you know, we added a drill in September that was in our disclosure. So we're at two drills now. And again, as as Caroline spoke to, I mean, we've continued to grow our input. So from 7,000 meters to 20, to 12,000 meters, we've now got about 20,000 meters into the project. We're hoping to grow that again next year. But with that, you know, the additional uh, resources coming online, I mean, we do see additional news flow coming forward. And I think there'll be a fairly steady cadence as we've been actively drilling uh, the majority of this year. This is a project that you can drill 365 days a year uh, at a very attractive cost base. It's likely one of the lowest cost centers for exploration uh, in North America. And for that reason, you know, we're going to continue to leverage that. We're going to continue to see active drilling at the project. We're going to continue to work towards, you know, increasing the the amount of activity at the project. And so that's going to return in the, in, the, in the same way in news flow. We're going going to see more results. We're going to see more frequent updates. We're going to see the ability to continue to evolve and have milestones attached to the story as well. Yeah. Yeah. And it, and it feels like to me, as you've progressed through the project and now had several years to work on it, um, like you alluded to earlier, your, your efforts can be more targeted and, um, in, in the opportunity is there to have, um, you know, more strategic decisions made, which will likely lead to, uh, better results as we, you know, as, as you guys progress through your, uh, through your ex exploration efforts. Is that, is that an accurate statement? It, it is. And, it, and you're not always in that level of favorability. I mean, we're, we're unfortunate to have come through a tough market cycle, mm -hmm. but, you know, at the same time, it's been very giving in our, in our ability to properly characterize, properly build our team, properly really create an environment that when the market turns on, which, you know, we feel this $2,600 gold plus market is that time yeah. that you need to be ready, right? You, you need to be ready for these moments where um, the availability of capital or the availability to, uh, of interest is there to actually advance a project with meaningful, um, you know, uh, output. So, so that's kind of where we're at today, you know, through a little bit of just attrition, you know, we've really worked hard to really crystallize the opportunity and make sure that we're ready to turn up the, you know, the activity level. And so that's, that's where we're at today on it. You know, we're very fortunate to be there, but we also think this is a very emergent cycle. I mean, I've been in this business um, for quite some time now, and we know it's cyclic. We know that these times come. And I mean, as much as the commodity prices are there, you know, I would suggest that there's still a lot of room for us to see these inputs flow into, you know, the junior and developer sectors, which yeah. is what we want to be a part of. I mean, we're really building that opportunity to really be successful in that method. Yeah. Pos positioning the company to, to really take advantage of what could be a great market cycle. Yes, we we could we could talk about twenty six hundred dollar gold for the rest of the <laughs> for the rest of the webinar. But I wanted to ask Dan uh, a question about Quebec and why location matters. Um, I guess specifically on Du Parquet, like the advantages that it has being in that location. And then Dan, second part of my question would be if you could touch on just kind of the the, the general uh, environment within Quebec within the gold mining sector right now. Yeah, I mean, where we are in Quebec, Ron, you've been there. This is, you know, really the center of the mining industry in Canada. Yeah. Um, we we didn't have the opportunity, I don't think, to do the drive from Val d'Or to Rouen Aranda, but you pass uh, a mine or a historic head frame like every five minutes on the highway. Yeah. 
It is such a, a mining culture. It's one of the uh, greatest concentrations of mining talent in the world. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people who go to work uh, at other mines really all over the world that start their journey from somewhere in the Abitibi uh, because it's just, again, such a great place with such a concentration of talent uh, and resources. You know, you got to remember from where we are within... 150 kilometers um, of, of Duparquet, you've got pretty much every mining supplier and mining contractor in the world, right? That is servicing operating mines from Timmins to Valdor. So, you know, just today in that region, there's the mines are producing, and the quick math would be probably somewhere between a million and a million and a half ounces of gold a year. Right. These are major mines and a real concentration of them. So how does that sort of play through uh, into our opportunity here? Number one, you know, we have amazingly talented people who come to work on the project every day. And that's our team. And it's a lot of the contractors that come in to work with us. Um, it, it shows up in, you know, the quality uh, and the cost of the drilling contractors that we get. And that is directly related to. Well, we kind of call our bang for the buck in exploration. There's not a better place to spend money because your money goes further and your productivity is some of the best productivity I think any of us have ever seen in exploration, particularly drilling uh, anywhere in the world in our careers. So it really is a remarkable place from that perspective. And where we are at Duparquet, <laughs> James makes this point all the time. Like if you're moving a piece of equipment around the Abitibi, the chances are you're probably going over our property. Yeah. Like it really is smack in the center. I mean, you, you spent a bit of time in, uh, in Ruin Aranda. You've got, you know, the, the, the uh, horn smelter that's been operating in Ruin for more than a hundred years. Like this is just such an established part of the community. And it, and it goes not just in terms of, of the human talent that there, but, it goes to the government and regulators and, um, you know, the general population's understanding and appreciation for the value of the mining industry and, and the role that that can play in bringing economic opportunities to people in the region. So, yeah, it's, it's a remarkable place. But the other thing just strategically to understand is... Um, we've all played Monopoly, like you can have a house on Baltic Avenue or yeah. you can have a house at Boardwalker Park Place, right? And it's the same little piece of plastic that you put out there, but it's worth a lot more in a better, uh, like on a better right. street, on a better property. <laughs> uh, and I'm playing a lot of Monopoly with my kids so that, you know, they usually sure. beat me. Um, <laughs> but that's that's the value of having, you know, three and a half million ounces of M&I and I'm two and a half million ounces of inferred, like one of the largest gold endowments in the in the Abitibi geographically located smack in the middle of it. This is a really strategic resource for the industry. And it's been largely ignored by the industry because it was held in private hands, more or less from the mid 1950s mm -hmm. and so it's missed generations of work that's that's happened on it there's you know other than a a real push of work from call it 2007 to 2014 where a lot of amazing work was done and we're the beneficiary of that but you know this this project uh in this endowment in anyone else's hands would have seen generations and generations of work and so we're you know, we, we take our stewardship of this project um, very seriously because it is a real opportunity that we have to take what was, you know, in the 1930s, the largest producing gold mine in Quebec. I like to remind people about that. Um, but we have the opportunity to really reinvigorate not just this project, but kind of the whole district that we're in. So it's very exciting times. So, so. Did I hear you say that the uh, within the property that that First Mining now owns at the Duparquet project that existed the biggest uh, gold mine in the 1930s in Quebec? 
The original Beatty mine, when it was Beattie producing, mine. was the largest gold mine in Quebec from the mid 1930s in well into the 1940s. So producing a hundred dish thousand ounces a year, and remember, it produced overall, um, you know, more than a million and a half ounces over a 20 year time frame. So, in, in James or Caroline can jump in, or or Dan and answer this question. Um, and I've heard this said many different ways, but that, that the best place to find gold is by an old gold mine. Is that, uh, is that a common saying within the gold explore, exploration field? No, that actually, uh, as it turns out, used to be the tag phrase for a company called Orizon Mines, uh, which had the Casa Berardi mine, which is about 100 kilometers north of Duparquet, maybe okay. 140. Uh, yeah, and and particularly at Duparquet, you know, James and Caroline can talk about it too. Um, but there's in in the generation of work that was done from 2007 to 2014, 2015, it almost exclusively focused on an open pit opportunity, which we still have, which we think is large and very robust. But they looked at that and basically ignored the depth potential. In a geologic environment in the Abitibi where, you know, the conventional wisdom is that the real mines don't start until a kilometer down. This is the reason that that this is such a great uh, gold endowed region. The reason that it is so well known and that so many ounces have been produced in the Abitibi is because it is renowned for its vertical continuity. It's renowned for these deposits not only to to have to have continuous gold mineralization as you go deeper but often it gets wider and higher grade to depth and that's exactly what we're starting to see at Duparquet. you know when we show the 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 picture it's there's hardly a drill hole deeper than 500 meters and they mined it down 500 meters and they never ran out of ore in this in this project so that's where the real opportunity to open it up at depth comes in. And James and Caroline can talk a bit more about that. Yeah, I can talk a little bit about the, the shadow of the head frame is, you know, kind of the other way of looking at it. But yeah, it really is about that favorable horizon. And the endowment is what we speak to is like, you know, these areas have, there's a specific reason. And it's about getting those ingredients right at the bigger scales. You know, there's a lot of things happening in, you know, large crustal levels of geology. And this goes back, you know, 2.7 billion years ago. It's a long time ago, but there's favorable conditions that created the right environment. And for that reason, Reason, um, you know, they're a great place to look for these deposits. And we just happen to be in a, in a very prolific belt for it. Uh, and staying close to these, these historic mines is certainly, you know, a recipe for success as well. There is something about closeology and being in the right real estate. Dan talked about a little bit, you know, putting yourself in the right position to have success. And, you know, similarly, it's the same thing in any other sport. If you want to score a goal, you've kind of got to be in the right place, which is usually in front of the net and somewhere where you get a couple of good shots at it and so you know here we are in Duparquet and you know we feel that there's a number of opportunities that lead to our success and we spoke to the fact that you know there is deep rooted systems in these Archean environments we know that these deposits go down many kilometers probably beyond the levels at which we'll ever be able to extract them so for us you know there's still a lot of open space to accommodate, you know, discovery and extensional potential within the belt. And, and also the other th side about these areas is there's a lot of diversity in the deposit styles. It's not like it's just one make or one model of deposit. And so Dan spoke to how, you know, previous screening kind of had a bit of a bias towards one style of deposit, one level of opportunity of mineralization. And it, it really has, you know, allowed us to take an open look at the canvas. And there's a lot of blank canvas where we can apply our screening, our filtering, our inputs and exploration approach that can evolve new discoveries and new ideas and concepts. But that's what's important about, you know, some of these historic gold camps, if you will, is that's what really makes them special is that they continue to give, they continue to surprise, they continue to get better. And, you know, it's like other things that are the best in class in, in their category, they always have these abilities to impress. And that's what we feel about Duparquet and 
and, you know, going back to our results, I think you can look at them and see as well that, you know, even ourselves, you know, in our, in our greatest, you know, kind of achievements, you know, we're really encouraged by what we're getting for feedback from the drill results. You know, we're looking for this stuff and it's speaking to us on kind of levels that even, you know, we're, you have, have expectations that we're over exceeding. I mean, we have kind of a threshold now where we're really focusing on three to four gram kind of opportunity and discovery. And we have results that are coming back, you know, from six, seven, eight, nine, and 10 grams, you know, over significant composites. Interesting. Interesting. You know, uh, Dan, you, you mentioned monop monopoly earlier, and you also mentioned how these properties uh, were, were kind of independently owned for decades and decades and were somewhat, I guess you could say, ignored to a certain extent. And I know about two years ago, it was a big, big accomplishment. I know Keith, I've heard Keith Newmeyer, uh, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but that from the founding of the company, he was very interested in getting these properties together. And, um, and when that happened, uh, that was a big deal, which now allows for, for them to be um, explored and developed kind of together in aggregate. It feels like to me, if we were playing Monopoly, right, like you had Park Place, you uh, Boardwalk, like you, you put together three of the best properties uh, all in one. And now as we move forward, um, whether you want to look at it from a jurisdictional perspective, a geological perspective, that there's a lot of, a lot of opportunity. I guess my, my, my next question would be, how do you see Duparquet progressing over the next, let's say one to three to five year time frame? Any, any thoughts on that? Yeah. I mean, I think we're, we're, um, well, we put out the the preliminary economic analysis last year that showed, you know, a big and robust project at Duparquet. Um, you know, keep in mind we put that out with a gold price of eighteen hundred dollars an ounce. Mm -hmm. If you look at that project today, as it was scoped, uh, as it was scoped a year ago, and only a year ago, uh, but you run at anything like a twenty five, twenty six hundred dollar gold price. You know, every hundred dollars in the gold price is about a hundred million U.S. of after-tax NPV on on uh, that larger project at Duparquet. We know a couple of things about this deposit. Number one, we know that there are a couple of pretty interesting higher-grade areas that potentially you could start um, with a smaller mine, mm -hmm. and that's something that we're looking at now uh, is just scoping that higher margin, higher grade opportunity. Um, and I think that's, it's very important just to demonstrate the flexibility that is inside this deposit that a lot of people don't appreciate. So we're looking at that. Um, but I think it's, you know, uh, germane to the, to the conversation today, the strategic interest of this deposit, I think can change dramatically um, with a, the handful of uh, more drill results, kind of like we had in whole 2424. Mm -hmm. You know, the more that we are able to demonstrate, and, and James had made a, a, a quick allusion to it, but if you take out the ounces that were um, that were mined out of this deposit, in the top 500 meters, you know, the overall endowment, and I'll I'll uh, do my best to uh, well count the the mined ounces as uh, you know not inferred. Uh, the, the most true kind of ounces are the ones that are out of the ground and sold. Um, but you know, in total, it's uh, you know call it uh, five million ounces of uh, of you know M and I plus what's been what's been uh, mined, and then another million ounces, million and a half ounces have inferred that's there just in the, in the core du parquet deposit that's in the, in the top 500 meters. And so the real trick is within an area of structural continuity, what is it to say that you're not going to have similar kind of million ounces per hundred meters vertical uh, that you could extend these things as you go deeper. Now you need to find the higher grade, but that's the real significance of what the exploration program is achieving right now is it is demonstrating that there are significant widths of significantly higher grade, which have an opportunity to add a lot of value to a development scenario. So I, I really see it evolving down up two parallel paths, well, really three. One is, um, you know, us continuing to scope 
and actually conduct a bunch of environmental baseline uh, data collection and move forward a project at Duparquet because it is really important that we actually move forward toward, I think, uh, call it a production scenario. Uh, and we think there's actually an interesting way that we can do that more quickly uh, by focusing on smaller, higher margin uh, tons in the, you know, in, in the mine plant. So we're working on that um, and we're optimistic what, what the initial uh, work is telling us on that. At the same time, uh, you know, we're looking at, at aggressively growing the deposit at depth, along strike, regionally. Uh, and having success literally at all three of those different uh, avenues for continuing to grow it. And then the third part is, you know, there is uh, the important part of managing the uh, legacy that's environmental legacy that's left from the old producing project. And that's something that we're making uh, very good strides on. And, and it's important, a very important part of, of our commitment to the project and to the community is advancing that work as well. So, you know, our our goal is, uh, you know, particularly on the exploration side, um, it's, you know, we're not we're not looking at uh, marginal ounce additions here. James and Caroline can talk a little bit more about what the targets are. Caroline, you want to uh, jump in? Yeah. Again, I'm just alluding to a lot of what we have spoken about is bringing all of this data together, consolidating it, and then developing these targets, finding those higher grade opportunities that we are seeing in strategic places um, outside that main resource. Um, and then also extending that you know, across the property. We've got some very exciting fieldwork targets that we're also developing and advancing through. We're doing the last bit of data collection before the snow chases us out. Um, and then we are going to push on that. Um, and we have classified and prioritized them. We've got our you know, target ranking matrix to make sure that we know the opportunities that will align with our strategic and corporate objectives. Okay, thank you. James, any, uh, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I, I think it's just important to understand that, you know, we're really looking at big centers of gravity here. I mean, our exploration approach, you know, given the scale of, of the, you know, regional endowment and current resource uh, configuration, you know, we're really looking to make meaningful efforts towards growth. So if you think about the millions of ounces that we have at Duparquet, I mean, ultimately, you know, to have meaningful growth, we're looking at, you know, certainly, you know, 10, 20, 30 percent growth is what we're looking for. And if you start running those numbers, you know, on the resource benchmark, Benchmark. I mean, they're significant. You know, we're looking at targets typically, you know, if we can't get into something and that doesn't have, you know, a potential to have a scale of 250,000 ounces minimum. I mean, you know, we're passing that on because we have, you know, a real opportunity to shift things here in big, meaningful ways. And so that's what we're working towards. We really want to grow this deposit meaningfully. And so that's kind of the objective of our team. We have objectives that we deliver internally to our team. We have corporate objectives we're trying to meet. But, you know, Ultimately, you know, I'd really like to, as Dan said, take this and look to either double or triple the current endowment that we have in resource. And I think it's, you know, given what we see, you know, again, it's very data driven. We can look at the data. We can look at how many ounces are hosted in a certain amount um, of area that's been explored. And we can look at how much area hasn't been explored. And we definitely can take that footprint and we can move it around the property and we can see the ability to double and triple the potential uh, of the opportunity here at Duparquet. Wow. Thank you, James. Uh, Caroline, James, Dan, uh, this has been great. I, I need to ask you, is there anything I forgot to ask you today or anything that any of you want to mention before we, we sign off today from our webinar? No, I'm good. Only uh, that if people want more information, they know where to track down Paul, uh, the famous Paul Morris. Uh, um, and uh, the website is obviously a great source of, uh, of information as well, www.firstmininggold.com. Yes, and I, and I always have Paul Morris's email address in the description of every one of the videos. So he loves to talk to investors. He does a great job for the company. Uh, this has been a great webinar. I feel like you know I am an investor in the company, it's a company I've followed for years, and I feel like I've gained a deeper appreciation, but also excitement level about what's going on at Du Parquet. Um, you know, Caroline, James, and, and Dan, you all offered your own kind of individual angles uh, and, and input into what's going on there. But, you know, when I look at 
uh, as an investor, when I look at Du Parquet, and, and that's just one of the big projects that the company has, uh, when I consider you know, the jurisdiction, right? That there are roads and there's power and everything right there. It's a mining friendly area with a deep history. And I think one of the, one of the things that I, that I get real excited about is this idea that for really the first time in decades, this property has all been brought together and now kind of offering a big canvas uh, that James and Caroline as, as the exploration team um, explained a big canvas to go out and, and look at different opportunities within that and that there's been several years spent on that and and then decades prior, right? And we didn't even mention the fact that I forget what the number was, a hundred million dollars where the drilling had been done by, by previous operators. Uh, it's very exciting, very exciting. And, uh, and again, like Dan said, if people want to learn more, they can go to firstmininggold.com. The stock is traded in the U S with the stock symbol FFMGF and in uh, Canada, Toronto, with the stock symbol FF. And, and we will reiterate one more time, if you want to get more information, want to talk to a real live human uh, at the company, you can reach out to Mr. Paul Morris. Uh, thank you guys. This has been great. Um, and I'll look forward to seeing you all again another time here uh, in the basement. That's thank awesome. You. Thanks for having us, Ron. Thank, thank you, Ron. You. All the best. Bye.